Because, friends, we know, we know that we all have a tendency to fall away, so to speak, to grow cold, to get excited about all the wrong things. We get excited about the many, many things, but God's kingdom, uh, it's boring. Ministry, uh, boring. Serving God, someone else, someone else. That provokes God's jealousy if you belong to him. We've been working through today, uh, this year, uh, messages on God's attributes, what God is like. And we've seen some, some attributes that entirely expected that God is loving, he's holy, righteous, patient, he's eternal, he has no limits. But we're going to add something to that picture today. And that is that God is jealous. Now, this is an attribute with an edge. There's an edge. God is jealous. And uh, we could say that he is strongly jealous. Strongly jealous about certain things. When uh, we read from those two passages in, uh, in Exodus, from Exodus 20 and Exodus 34, twice, God talks about his jealousy, his jealousy. Uh, His jealousy was a reason why his people should not serve after other gods. In fact, when we read from that passage in Exodus 34, it's not just that God is is jealous, but that his, his name is jealous. One of his many names in scripture is jealous. We can say that God is love. We can also say that his name is jealous. Now, now jealousy has a, usually a very negative connotation because most of the time, most of the time we are jealous for all the wrong reasons. Jealousy is that, is that really strong negative feeling about someone that has something that we don't have or that we would like to have. Someone enjoys some kind of advantage. They have an advantage that we don't enjoy. And and jealousy is a sport for the young and old. It's a sport for the young and old. For Christians and non-Christians. Jealousy is just as rife in a ministry setting as it can be in a secular setting. We can be jealous virtually about anything and anyone. So it can be that negative resentment against someone that has something that we would like. It's gonna happen this Christmas morning coming up, is it not? It's gonna happen. Jealousy is gonna set in because some kid got the wrong toy or their brother and sister got a better one it's coming it's coming and it it happens to us oldies because we love our toys too and we don't like it when someone has a better toy than the toy we drive and the things we have but jealousy can also have a positive aspect in the sense of of, of being vigilant in, in maintaining or protecting what we have. There is this reaction against losing something that is ours. Someone said that the jealousy of God, God's jealousy, is one of our greatest challenges and comforts. The jealousy that God has perfectly can be for his people both a comfort, but also a great challenge and a great warning. Someone said this, that a God who is not jealous, if God wasn't jealous, that would be as contemptible, it'd be as bad as a husband who didn't care whether or not his wife was faithful, or a wife who couldn't care if her husband was faithful to her. It would be that bad and the writer said part of the problem with this 
profound reality is that we have come to regard religion, like everything else, as a matter of choice. It's just sort of who we choose to worship. We resent monopolies, the writer says. But the unique and incomparable only living God makes necessarily exclusive claims and has the right to a monopoly on our love. God has a right to be jealous of his people's affection. What we love, Christian, is God's business. It's his business. And he has every right to be interested in the things that we love. That writer finished by saying jealousy is God's love protecting itself. Another writer said God, in jealousy, God's jealousy is God continually seeking to protect his own honor. His own honor. Uh, if Israel were to break the Ten Commandments and were to go after other gods, this would be a violation of God's exclusive right to be honored and to be glorified. Now that's in Exodus. Do you know the first couple of times that jealousy gets mentioned in the Bible are within a family? Within a family. In Genesis 30, for instance, Rachel is jealous of her sister Leah because Leah is producing the children for their mutual husband, Isaac. Jealousy. And you can see how that was kind of warranted, kind of not. There is the jealousy in Genesis 37 of Jacob's sons who are jealous because their brother Joseph is getting all of the father's affection and their jealousy was not entirely misdirected as, as sons, as children with a father. There was a love and affection that should have been coming their way. And so Jacob did make it hard for his sons. He did make it hard for them in favoring one over the other. And so you have this, this jealousy coming out within, within a family tainted by sin and complicated by sinful choices. Thus, a lot of our jealousy is just kind of a form of covetousness. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an expression of an idolatrous heart often enough. Rachel is trying to protect her relationship with her husband and Jacob's sons are trying to protect and improve the relationship with their, with their father. It's about protecting what was rightfully theirs, but perverted by sin. Well, God's thoughts and feelings are not perverted by sin. And God has a glory that is always worth protecting and God fighting for. God is, is, is jealous. There's another word in the Old Testament called uh, it's translated zeal. Zeal could also be translated jealousy or jealous. God is very zealous or, 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 or jealous concerning his name, his glory, his people, his right to receive worship, even the land, even the city of Jerusalem. God is zealous over Someone else said that godly jealousy is not the insecure, insane, possessive human jealousy that we often interpret this word to mean. Rather, it's an intensely caring devotion to the objects of his love. Like a mother's zealous protection of her children, a father's zealous guarding of his home. These are admirable qualities. And so what I'd like to do today is to look at a few passages where the jealousy of God appears and how we as Christians should respond to our jealous God. We were in Exodus in our reading. If you would turn over to Deuteronomy 4 for a moment, please. Deuteronomy 4. <clears throat> we have something else that God tells us about. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23, verse 23, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, 
It's Exodus 20 and 24. And make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. Now, in one sense, why does this need to get repeated? Because it's there in Exodus many times. And remember, God delivered his people out of Egypt through ten plagues where, where, where plague by plague, judgment by judgment, God crushes all the different gods of Egypt including Pharaoh. You think that would be a cure for their idolatry. You think that after God ten times shows his power, he is the true and only God, that, that are they going to get tempted? Of course not. Maybe lust. Maybe disobeying parents. Maybe covetousness. But, but idolatry, surely they're over that. They weren't over that. They weren't over that. For Christians today who have been saved by God's grace forgiven by God you'd think we'd be over the idols I got bad news I got bad news we still have indwelling sin we still have temptation we still have the taste we got the taste in our mouth from those years in Egypt we still got the taste for sin and if we feed it we'll serve it and so God says, don't go back, but then look at verse 24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. These two images together, a consuming fire and a jealous God. Now that consuming fire helps us understand what it means that God is jealous. Because we know what, we know what a good what a good fire does when we gather around a fire and toast our marshmallows and everything else and we know when we come out the next day all the wood has been consumed it's ash a consuming fire takes in everything it leaves nothing behind well that's what God is like with us he wants all of us at all times in every setting, in every place. Just like a good wife and good husband wants their spouse. Without reservation. Not with an eye for anyone else. Our guide is like that. He is a consuming fire. God finds it, I'll use the word, he finds it intolerable intolerable when his own children now the unsaved are the unsaved we shouldn't get upset when the unsaved act like they're unsaved but but when when a believer goes after other idols then god finds that intolerable why because we belong to him we belong to him we're his we're not strangers we're his children he takes it personally and it's right for him to do so and then if you go over a couple of chapters to Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 6, and in verse 10, he promises them blessings. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things. You could say God gave them turnkey. Is that what they call it? Turnkey accommodation. Turn the key, you're in ready to go he said you didn't do any of these things houses verse are full of good things which you did not fill hewn out wells which you didn't dig incredible vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant you see the previous inhabitants had done that for them and then he says in verse 12 then beware beware Lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. Don't go back to what you were. And then we have the reason in verse 15. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. He's among you. He's with you. He's not distant. 
He's there with you in the land as he was with you in Egypt. Now he's going to be with you. He is watching. Uh, friends, a Christian has not just God among us. We have, we have the Holy Spirit in us. It gets even more intense. It gets even more proximate. The Lord God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. This is very strong language. It sounds like what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. It sounds like what he had done to the Egyptians to consume them. And he had at times. He had. God doesn't make empty threats. He doesn't fail to follow through. And this jealousy of God, it, it, it is a teaching uniquely for God's people, for his people, because he's in a relationship with us and we with him. This is especially relevant for God's children. Because, friends, we know, we know that we all have a tendency to fall away, so to speak to grow cold, to get excited about all the wrong things. We get excited about the many, many things, but God's kingdom, uh, it's boring, boring. Ministry, uh, boring. Serving God, someone else, someone else. That provokes God's jealousy if you belong to him. And then if you would turn over into the prophets to Isaiah 9, Isaiah chapter 9. And I want you to turn here particularly because, you know, it's going to be December soon. And we tend to go to those same half dozen passages, do we not, at Christmas? The same half dozen passages. Isaiah 9. And we know verse 6 well. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It says the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But look at verse 7. This is a future promise of, of the increase of his government. Christ didn't set up a government when he came the first time. He set up no governing, government as such. He came to be saviour and servant. Of his government and peace, there'll be no end. But, but, but look at this, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, oh, we have these Old Testament promises that have come back into the foreground. God promised David a king on his throne to order and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Now, let me read the last part of the verse this way. The jealousy of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Why is God going to establish an eternal kingdom one day? His jealousy will make sure it happens. Because he's going to fulfill his word. And mankind has never done a good job governing themselves. It always gets messed up. It always gets perverted and somehow corrupted. There are better forms than others. And there are brighter periods in, in, in human history than than, than other darker periods, but man by and large cannot rule justly. But the second Adam will. And believer, don't be in any doubt, the jealousy of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God will carry out his future promises that his son Jesus Christ will reign on the earth. The jealousy of God. Well, what are some implications of that truth for us? We serve a jealous God. How should we, should our reaction be? Well, if you turn over to Matthew 22, please, Matthew 22. And this is not a surprising passage, in a sense. But think about the jealousy of God. Look at verse 37 of Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And we could, we, we could add this echo because he's a jealous God. And with all your soul because God is, is jealous. 
and with all your mind because God is a consuming fire. So we have every reason to serve him. And, you know, maybe we have some teens here today, those that are closer to finishing school. Keep God at the forefront of your decisions. If you belong to him, young person, he is jealous. He is jealous for your heart. And the decisions you make are not just about you. not just about you. If you're a Christian, it's really all about God. It's about how he's made you and how he's gifted you. And so you want to make decisions and steps to glorify him and not glorify you. I mean, I tell you, you're going to make a lot of decisions from 18 to, you know, 30. There's a lot of things that happen between those two periods, right? That, that just have a way of setting your feet on a certain pathway. And with God's help, you want to be pointed in the right direction. Remember, God is a jealous God. And glorify him in your decisions. And then if you go over to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul takes the Corinthians to task. He takes the Corinthians to task. He says in verse 2. He says, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Paul knew there was sinful jealousy. He knew even a pastor could have a, a sinful, selfish jealousy for people's affection. He knew that. But he says, look, I, I'm jealous for you. It's a godly jealousy. For I have, and, and, and look, at the, look at the imagery here again. It's familiar. For I have betrothed you to one husband. I've got you ready for the Lord. I've got you ready for him. Paul's been like that faithful wedding coordinator. He just wants to get the bride to the altar, so to speak. Doesn't want to see her sidetracked. Maybe there's a better guy out there. Maybe there's someone better than the one that I'm engaged to. Paul says, listen, I've, I've got you ready for one husband that I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Or maybe a jealous father, so to speak. But then he says in verse 3, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity, the, the straightforwardness that is in Christ. He's concerned about deception concerned about their spiritual deception because he says in verse 4 for if he who come, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted you may well put up with it he says you might well be duped you might well be duped Paul is concerned as a good pastor with with, with the danger of those to whom he ministered being carried away by false teachers. And it's been noted that the problem with false teaching, listen very carefully, the problem with false teaching about God is it misrepresents him. And God is jealous of his name. I mean, imagine, for instance, you're trying to sell your house. And I'll just imagine it's the, it's the usual four-bedroom, two-bathroom, backyard, etc. And imagine you engage a real estate agent. Now, I know that ads are up on the internet and everyone can see everything. But imagine if you had an agent running around town saying to people, I've got this wonderful three-bedroom house. Not much of a backyard. It's four-bedroom, you idiot. It's got two bathrooms. You're going to sack him. Are you not? That agent sacked because they, they, they are misrepresenting your precious home. And you want to get a good deal for it, right? Now, I know there are some problems with that illustration, but that's, that's, that, you'd have outrage over that. You'd have outrage. 
The problem with false doctrine is that it misrepresents who God is. When people preach that you're saved by faith in Jesus, plus your own good works, they're misrepresenting Jesus as the all-sufficient saviour. Because Jesus can save you fully. He can do it on his own. He doesn't need your good works. He doesn't need your help. He wants your faith and repentance. False teaching misrepresents God, who he is. And so, Paul says, I've, I've got a jealousy for you. And any, any, any good shepherd, any good shepherd is, is jealous for his sheep. And is concerned about the wolves. They're concerned about the wolves. And occasion, occasionally in churches, wolves do come. And that's when I show my teeth. Because the wolves don't care about the sheep. They don't care for the sheep. They want to hurt the sheep and harm the sheep. And so those as, as leaders do, do have and should have a godly jealousy. And the jealousy isn't that they go somewhere else. That's not the issue. The, the issue is, are they being fed God's word? Are they hearing about a God rightly represented? And then finally today, we can and should serve God with zeal. Serve God with zeal. Remember when Jesus overturned the money changers in the temple? He actually did it twice, beginning and end of his ministry. The zeal, the jealousy that he had for God's house consumed him. Serving the Lord with zeal. Christians in Titus 2 are to be known as being zealous for good works. One way that we can show that we believe that God is jealous for our love and our affection and our service is by serving in a zealous way. Is by serving him in a way that has an enthusiasm and a love for people, a love for God. Because God is worthy to be served. He's not indifferent about you. Don't be indifferent about him. He's not lackadaisical about our salvation. He is zealous for our salvation. So we should be zealous for his work. God is a consuming fire. I mentioned that quote that this truth can be comforting or challenging. It's challenging if God sees one of his sons or daughters knee deep in idolatry. God's got to act. God's got to act. When God sees a zealous believer, keen, excited, wanting to serve him, it warms his heart. It brings joy to the heart of God. I trust we can do that today. To bring joy to his heart. Joy to the heart of God through our zeal for him.